Hair, feet, hands, people, characters. You gotta learn this stuff and I'm here to teach you exactly how. Even action poses. However, a lot of you watching this video are not subscribed. Criminals! Oh, what crime. Click it. Hurry. <laughs> so, expect more content from me in the future. And for my new subscribers, welcome to the gray box. This is a completely remote online art academy for free where every single week you, me, and everyone else get together and learn together. You guys really enjoyed the last video of the 15 day beginner to professional artist challenge. And though I had some setbacks and it was a little bit rushed, it was very fun to work on and the reception was amazing. So expect more content like that in the future. And for the next video, we're going to be going over environments specifically with this cityscape that I sketched a few years back. So if you want to learn how to draw this, Tune in next week. Now, let's get into the meat of things. Characters are tough to draw, and we touched on this lightly in a video earlier this week, but this time, along with that, we'll also be covering how the muscles and forms can contort, contract, and more specifically, how to solve the issue of confusion that arises every single time you pick up that tablet. We're gonna trudge through the murky waters of anatomy. As a professional artist, I've had the fortunate opportunity of experiencing different industries and the different workflows and styles they introduce when it comes down to anatomy, but generally, they always have to draw hands, arms, necks, hips, abs, back, butts. It's all so complicated, but wait. Last week, we covered simplification in shapes. So let's just simplify anatomy and break it into parts. Sounds violent. For the head, I usually try to keep this simple, but the general rule of thumb is that you put two ovals or two very similar shapes. Could be cylinders, could be complete circles, but I like to go with ovals. Imagine like a potato shape with a sheet of paper glued to only one side of it. Well, this is kind of what you get as a face shape. Now, this isn't how you draw every single face. Everyone has a different shaped face. Maybe their nose and mouth protrudes more than their forehead. Maybe the back of the head is more flat. Maybe it's more angular. There are so many different shapes and sizes, but this will be the base that you can operate around. You've seen this everywhere, how these lines are drawn onto a human head. Yes, these are guidelines, and there are many different ways to actually do this. There's the infinity sign for the eyes. There's the skull technique, where you quite literally just try to draw a skull and then layer in the fleshy parts over it. But for this, we're sticking with our potato and sheet of paper. So draw a line across that paper and just try to keep the eyes along that line. Now, it doesn't have to be exact because truthfully, realistic humans have a bit of asymmetricality, parts that are just not symmetrical at all. So if you're doing a portrait of someone, don't try to correct too much of their features unless they ask you to. You gotta understand the realism behind it before you can stylize it. And I'll make a video on style very soon. To dumb it down, your style is only developed by how you simplify objects within the world. You don't just make a style and then suddenly you're good at art. You're good at art first and then your style shows itself. So when people say, oh, I can't draw black people, that doesn't suit my style. No, that is a human being you can draw draw that in your style, you just don't know how to and don't want to learn. For those of you who want to learn, bravo, I love you. Whenever I teach people to draw hands, I usually say something along the lines of, treat each section of the hand as if it were a massive pillow pinned to a board or a wooden stick. For the fingers, it sticks. For the palm, it's a big board with like a little hinge where it can open like a book, sort of. So all in all, keep it simplified down to pillow sticks and door hinges. The palm would be the central shape and where the knuckles would be is where your main hinge is gonna be. Then we'll add another hinge onto the side wherever the thumb is to allow that to fold in and out. For the fingers, these are your pillow sticks. Stack three sticks on top of each other and then just kind of ram that stack through some pillows. And then whenever you lean that stack, you get a distorted shape. All the folds, the pressure, this is why I say look at it like pillows. There's a lot of convoluted information out there, but if you can simplify it down to this, you're good. Now, let's say your art industry is medical and educational. Well, this channel is not that, but it is a great place to start and I would definitely recommend looking into actual anatomy after watching this video if that's what you want to do. For those of you who are not doing this to become an educational artist, you'll probably get through the industry just fine with just this knowledge. Not even kidding. And later we can even apply our learnings from hands to drawing wings, but we'll get to that in our video featuring creatures. Today, we're talking about humans. Now, I hear that the little like and subscribe buttons down below have a new satisfying animation whenever you click on them, and a large portion of you watching are not subscribed. You don't wanna miss out on a free art school, right? Now, onto the, uh, that's a drumstick. Now, hear me out. 
if you took a chicken drumstick and you just stretched it in Photoshop, well, this is what you get. And already it looks kind of like a forearm, a zombie forearm, I guess, but we can add healthy flesh to this if we just add some shapes in. And before you know it, you've got yourself a forearm. Something important to note is that the hand will always have a downward slant from wherever the wrist is. And whichever side the palm is facing, going down the wrist, that will be the skinniest part of the forearm perceivable. Regardless of how muscular the person or character may be, this will always be the skinniest part. Why stop there? We take that same drumstick. In fact, we can take the entire forearm that we just drew and transform that into a shin. Now, two things that are important to note about the shin is that the shin has two bones going down, just like the forearm. I know I didn't talk about this, but you likely will have seen it in the hand tutorial that was on screen a little while ago. The forearm has two bones that sort of rotate around each other whenever the palm rotates. Well, for the shin, it's not really so much of that. While it does rotate, that tiny little bone on the side is more so for support, and it allows the foot to rotate on a certain axis. It's just not as strong a rotation as the forearm can be. This is also why a kick to the side of the shin can instantly put a fighter out of commission. It's a fragile bone that if struck correctly will completely immobilize you. And of course, we can't forget the thighs. Thick thighs save lives. Now, the thigh has one big bone going up and connecting to the hip. Along that bone, it's sort of similar to the bicep if you look at it from the inner thigh. However, there are more than just two muscles present, so it shouldn't be treated the same as a bicep, but you can get roughly the same shape out of a completely relaxed thigh. Now, when it's flexed, it's gonna look a lot more like that little muscle that's on your shoulder right before you get to your bicep. The neck is a wad of muscle. There are a lot of muscles and tendons in this thing. So instead of stressing about making out the shapes of all those muscles, let's just make it a cylindrical tube. And this tube can bend and twist quite regularly. The most important thing to note about when a neck twists or bends is that the two frontal tendons that are usually connected all the way down to the collarbone will have a sort of pulling stress applied to them. And from whichever direction you have turned, that is the tendon that will pull most and be visible most. So if you're turning your head to your left, you'll find that your right neck tendon will be sort of showing. This is also the same line of tendons that show whenever you're making a grimacing face. Now, for the ear, we have a lot to go over, but don't worry, it'll be fine. There are a lot of different names for the pieces of the ear, but we're not gonna go over any of them. Instead, we're just gonna look at how the shapes work. This is gonna take a lot of practice, but remember, everything is 3D. I've seen so many people get stuck in the idea that ears are completely two-dimensional, and it leads to drawing completely flat surfaces that don't look good when rotated. So remember, everything that you draw has another side to it. For the red outline, we're gonna call that the ring. For the purple outlines, we'll call that the wave. And for the green outlines, we'll call that the mountain. The mountain can come in many different shapes and sizes, and it's not always very accentuated. Some ears don't really have a very noticeable mountain. But the ring and wave will always be present. And in some cases, if you're a fighter, you'll have this thing called cauliflower ear, which is basically where the ear has bulked up and swollen quite a lot from, well, being punched. When the human ear takes a lot of physical trauma, it tends to swell up at whatever point that the trauma was received. So just keep that in mind. If you have a character that's endured a lot of physical abuse, maybe just, you know, add that in as a little touch. Now onto feet. These suckers are quite a challenge for almost every single artist, and a lot of them don't really like to draw these. But in order to know how to draw a shoe, you gotta know how to draw a foot to some extent. Now remember earlier with the hands, the palm was a big board with a hinge on the top of it and on the side. Well, just erase that hinge from the side and keep the one on the top. This is basically how a foot works. Instead of having the thumb separate from the rest of the fingers, it has been pushed up along with the rest of them to just remain at the end. This would be the purple outline here. And for the red outline, we'll call this the base. And while the base of the foot itself doesn't really bend much, whenever you go on your tippy toes, that's when the bend happens. And the muscles inside will push your weight and the bones within to curve upward, offering you the height advantage that you might need for a certain situation. Now, drawing shoes onto a foot can be a bit difficult to figure out how it's gonna work, but it's important to remember that shoes will constrict the movement of the toes. So for this example, where we have the toes sort of fanned out, they wouldn't really be able to do that quite readily within the confines of a shoe. So focus more on what the foot shape generally is rather than where the toes are. The only toe that does most of the movement inside of a shoe is the big toe. And since we're drawing cloth folds onto the shoe, we're gonna get into that topic after we're done with the anatomy part. One of these shoes is drawn from reference and one of them isn't. Very clearly, you know which one. 
this is the importance of using reference and it is a very accepted practice in the industry. Do not ever stop using reference until you have a big enough, fat enough, juicy enough catalog that you can just draw things without even needing it. Now onto the torso. If you stuck along this far, make sure you hit that like button. And if you're not subscribed already, what are you doing? Now the torso anatomy can be broken down into three different parts, technically four, but we're going to combine two of them. Combining the chest and ribs, and apart from that, we have the waist and the hip. These will be highlighted in their respective colors, but this is just to help you understand the shapes. Notice how I'm not just cutting it off at what you see at the front. Everything is 3D, so we draw all the way through. You might be thinking, oh, that's not all that important. Yes, it is. Regardless of what angle you're drawing an object from, you need to make sure that you understand where the rest of it is going. Especially in the case of anatomy, this will help you to draw things far more realistically than you would if you just didn't pay attention. Notice how the pelvis is attached to the hip no matter what, and there's a little divot at the back for the tailbone. Slotted into both sides of that tailbone is the butt. But how do we draw that? Take a look at this. Remember that shape that you found on the thumb? You can actually use that as the shape for the butt. That's kind of how the wad of muscles there is shaped. It's like a diamond more so than a circle. So let's throw that into the mix. This is the muscle formation, but we add fat onto it because the butt tends to store a lot of fat. Now, in some cases, the butt can be completely flat, but on a lot of cases, it has at least a little bit of a bump. We've shown this a little bit, but there are different types of fat distribution around the body, as well as collection of of mass. But before we even get to fat distribution and collection of mass, there's this little thing called bone structure. Bones can be thicker, longer and or shorter, stubby, heavier, maybe even wider. This sort of dictates what your body will look like. And in most cases, even if your body looks a little bit weird to you, it's not really your fault. That's just genetics. I truly hope this helped you to understand how to draw people and characters way better. And remember, next week we're going to be going over environments, but the week after that we'll be going over character design. Paid personal critiques as well as official guidebooks will soon be available on the Cube Brush storefront for the low low, like $5. So if you've got some extra pocket change, don't miss out. I'll link it in the description and comments once it goes live. Maybe next week, who knows? But in the meantime, please treat each other well, get to know each other in the comments, and discuss the beauty that is art. Thank you for choosing the gray box today, and as always, I'll see you next week.